Hi, I'm Jennifer Tesher, founder and CEO of the Financial Health Network. Um, and I am thrilled to be here today uh, with Yelena McWilliams, the chairman of the FDIC, and Brian Brooks, the acting comptroller of the currency at the OCC. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. There's no shortage of topics for us to talk about. <clears throat> um, so I'm gonna get right into it. The one-two punch of the pandemic and the resulting financial fallout has created significant uncertainty about the overall health of the economy, especially since we just don't have a good sense yet of um, uh, how long it will take us to quote, get, get back to quote unquote uh, normal, whatever that means. Um, we're officially in a recession. Um, and when the pandemic first hit, we saw a lot of banks halt garnishments and grant customers loan forbearance and fee waivers. Many of those are now set to expire in the summer and fall at the same time that the extra $600 unemployment payments are also at the moment slated to come to an end. Um, also, a lot of uh, moratoriums that had been placed on evictions are also scheduled to come to an end. Uh, so this really is creating a perfect storm for um, certainly for consumers and potentially for the banks that serve them. So I'm wondering, uh, how are you advising the banks that you supervise about what they can and should be doing to accommodate their customers? And for how long, how long um, can they actually continue to grant these kinds of waivers and forbearance? Yelena, why don't we start with you? Sure, sure, happy to. So uh, it was important to us at the FDIC as soon as we uh, started having the, the, the sense of how big the pandemic is and the business uh, closures and the impact of the business closures on banks and customers and, the, and consumers in general throughout the country, it was important that we act very quickly. So early on, we have issued a statement encouraging banks to proactively modify these loans, to go out and, and call their customers. Literally, we said, call your small business customers, call your individual customers. Did you lose a job? You know, there was a Fed study that said that in uh, the month of March, 39% of households uh, making uh, $40,000 or less were furloughed or lost their job, which we knew that in a lot of these communities is going to be a shock to the system uh, because they won't be able to pay the rent or if they have mortgages, mortgages, et cetera. So we told banks, go work with them. And then we also worked with uh, Financial uh, account, uh, Accounting Standards Board, FASB, to make sure that they don't punish banks on the accounting standards and don't look at these loans as being impaired. And so we have done this extensive outreach, frankly, to tell banks, go early, go, go fast and go early and do whatever you can to modify loans and to talk to your customers. Go If you have a forbearance, that's fine. Work through this. And then on, on your second question, how long are we willing to go? However long is necessary. So we will do what it takes to make sure that the, the consumers are not disproportionately impacted above and beyond already the shock to the economy that they're experiencing with a loss of wages. Excellent. Brian? So, so Jen, you know, I, I would echo everything that uh, Yellen has said, and I think what you've seen in this uh, pandemic response situation is the coming together of the, regula uh, the regulators on this. So the OCC and the FDIC joined with the Fed in a series of interagency statements on these issues. Obviously, the Fed did a great job in providing liquidity facilities to make sure that liquidity stays in the system, and that's one reason you have seen something very, very different from the financial crisis, which is that credit is still widely available and liquidity is flowing through the system. Yesterday, you saw the capital numbers come out of the CCAR test, which show the banks are very strong. So I think it's going to be a very different uh, feel than, than that. I would say on the macroeconomic front, um, in terms of these things expiring and, and you know your comment about the perfect storm, the, the economic impact of the last three months, uh, I, I emphasize, was human caused. We, we were confronting an unknown disease of unknown magnitude, and so we made the collective decision to turn off the economy. That's how this was really different from the financial crisis. This was not that there was underlying risk in the economy. We, we made a decision to turn it off uh, to address certain unknown health risks. Since that time, we've gotten a lot more data about what all that looks like. And thus, we've, in many states, narrowed the scope of those orders and more, had more targeted responses with the result that the economic data now looks uh, very, very positive if it can be sustained. And so I was just looking this morning at the fact that, um, you know, in the last month, retail sales up 16.8%. Consumer spending up 8.2%, um, new home sales up 17%. I mean, there's a lot of very positive indicators if it can be sustained. And I think the issue for consumers is, can we get to a place where the economy is turned back on? If we can, 
then I think the need for these extraordinary interventions will over time go away. And if not, then, the, then they won't. And I guess the last point is one lesson the banks learned in the financial crisis is it's worse for banks to call the loans. It's worse for banks to foreclose than it is to look at loss mitigation strategies. We all learned that lesson 10 years ago, and I'm, I'm happy to see most of our banks sort of, uh, uh, you know, remembering that. Terrific. So I feel like we're a little bit in a time warp because we're supposedly in the age of technology in the 21st century, but in the, in the pandemic, we've seen millions of people waiting on paper checks from the federal government to get access to their COVID relief payments. And we've seen millions more people who had limited access to home Wi-Fi uh, and thus unable to access mobile or online banking services at a time when branches were closed or providing reduced service. I mean, many of us, myself included, thought that with the invention of the smartphone and the prepaid card, being unbanked was largely a thing of the past. But um, it turns out that's really not the case. Um, now, there are no shortage of ideas for how to expand access to accounts or to expand access to the payment system. And we've heard a growing chorus of these ideas um, in recent months, postal banking, Fed accounts, uh, digital fiat currency, new charters to bring more fintech players into the mix, and which is something you in particular, Brian, have been talking a lot about. Uh, what do you think we can do once and for all to drive the number of unbanked people in America to zero? Um, and uh, how do you think, what are you thinking about these um, various ideas that are being floated out there? Um, and then finally, uh, what can traditional banks do to attract low income consumers who frankly are wary of high fees and who in many cases, particularly among people of color, have had poor experiences with banking in the past? Look, I, I, I would I would say a couple of things. So, so first of all, to your point about things like postal banking and Fed accounts and everything, you know, I think anybody who's been in the Apple Store recently and also been in the post office recently knows that we do an amazing job in this country of harnessing market forces and bringing beautiful private sector experiences to people who can afford it and have access. Everybody wants to go to the Apple Store. Nobody wants to go to the post office, and, and I would say if the most aspirational we can be is to is to consign you know lower income people to banking at the post office, that's a bad. And I think we can do better than that. So at the OCC, what we're really focused on is is what are the institutional barriers to bank access that exist today. Now I can't solve people's home Wi-Fi systems, but what I can solve is the idea that you know as a bank supervisor, we're really requiring banks as part of model risk management to use FICO scores instead of artificial intelligence to underwrite customers. That's a problem when 45 million Americans don't have a FICO score, you know? And so we need to press our technology companies to synthesize other me measures of willingness to repay. And as regulators, we need to validate those models and let them be used and, 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 and let them be spread more widely. Another example would be coming out of the financial crisis, you know, we had hundreds of thousands of REO properties, you know, post foreclosure properties sitting vacant and the banks and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac wouldn't sell those for any amount less than the unpaid balance of the defaulted loan. And since they weren't worth that, no one would buy them. That's a giant sort of exclusion of a whole bunch of people from home equity when what we should have done is had a national REO bank and sold those properties for $100 and carried with them a renovation mortgage so that we could build communities and allow, allow people to build equity. So what I'm really focused on is identifying all the regulatory barriers to people participating both in bank accounts and also in wealth creation that credit makes possible and solving those. That's something Yella and I from our positions have the power to do and I know we're both committed to doing that. All right, I'm gonna come back to you on charters. Yelena, your your technology glitch we were remarking it did, it it perfect did. time because it just, you know, demonstrated what we were talking about. So um, thank you for that. Um, you really didn't miss much. Um, uh, but where do you come down on this issue? Um, how do we once and for all um, get rid of this problem of people not having access to an account, to the payment system, et cetera? It's a great question. And um, I would say that the main driver of people not having the account is that they have to see value. So they have to see a value proposition in being banked. And it's not just, I have an account and I'm being banked, and that's my value proposition. What does it mean for me? Because frankly, a lot of, you know, the FDIC does the survey 
of unbanked and underbanked households in the United States. And so we go into some of the logistics and the details as to why they're underbanked, including, did you ever have an account? And if so, why don't you have an account anymore? Or how many accounts do you have? And what do you look, in, look for in your account? And so one of the things that we found out is that um, a lot of the consumers got burned by their experience of having an, having an account. And a lot of the unbanked and underbanked households are low and moderate income households. And those consumers, when you think about it, uh, and, and I'll tell you a personal story in a second, if you have $100 and you put it in the bank and you're actually not really earning interest and you have to go walk to the bank to get your $20 out, right, if you need cash, there, there's little value proposition to you. You need to see something more and you need to see the big picture. And the big picture is that you become a part of the banking system and hopefully with the evolution in that banking system, you get to the point where the system works for you. Uh, and um, I, you know, I obviously have an accent, so I, I wasn't born and raised in the United States. And so when I emigrated to the United States on my 18th birthday by myself, I had $500. And it, it became very clear to me that I should put the $500 in a bank because you should keep your money in a bank to keep it safe, right? Uh, and since that was all the money I had in the world, $500, it was important for me to be safe. And so I opened up a banking account, a checking account the very next day. Uh, in July of 1991, I still have the same bank checking account. And uh, from there, I realized I should have a credit card because everybody seems to be using a credit card. And my, my, my consumer uh, um, ability to, to purchase, my, my ability to be a good consumer and use credit would be good because I could buy more. I could leverage that credit card. And so I applied for a credit card and uh, was, of course, denied. I had no income, no job, no assets. And I was new, newly arrived in the United States. But I was offered a secured credit card. And then so I sent $300 of my $500 and I got a secured credit card. And after 12 months of uh, on-time payments, they sent me uh, an unsecured credit card. And all of a sudden, I was a part of the banking system. And back then, I didn't know what that meant. But it meant that later on, I would build my credit. Later on, I would be able to qualify for student loans. I would be able to qualify for a car loan, house loan. So I would be able to build equity in the system itself i would and, and and i think by becoming banked people people have an incentive to partake in the society they are no longer disenfranchised they are members of the society and i think that is something that banks frankly need to work on to educate consumers a why the, there's a benefit to being banked and the fdic has a role here to play as well and and b how you benefit it's not just the checking account it's your ticket to becoming a shareholder in the United States of America and belonging. And I think that's something that we all, both banks and the regulators uh, and the industry as a whole, have a lot more work to do to sell the premise of why being banked is a value proposition to the customer itself. So, Yelena, uh, do you think the banking system we have today and the banks that we have today are sufficient um, in order to tackle these issues? Um, or do you think that somehow um, uh, digital fiat currency and direct central bank accounts, for instance, which are being bandied about quite a bit right now, um, are necessary? Or there's something else that's necessary as what I would maybe call an account of last resort? Right. So I think that more choices for the consumers are better, generally better, right? But there is such a thing as having too many choices and getting stifled in your decision making with too many choices. Uh, and so I do think that there is an opportunity for, for banks to think anew, for challenger banks. We have seen a number of challenger banks coming in and offering online only accounts with no fees whatsoever. Uh, and then we have seen fintechs in this space as well. So the question is, which of this venue is going to serve the customer better, especially that unbanked consumer that is looking for, for why should I have an account, right? Uh, and, and, and what is the benefit to me in the long term. So I do think there is an opportunity to work with the existing infrastructure to allow new infrastructures to come in and all of these challenging, challenging either banks or, or models or fintechs or technology companies that are not even fintechs in this space uh, and to do so in a responsible way, which is why I, I, you know, Brian is, is, is wise to think of, of, of the you know, National Bank Charter as, as a, with a new lens. And at the FDIC, we're also trying to make sure that fintechs and these challenger banks and the new companies understand 
you can, you can become a part of the regulatory framework and you can offer these products to customers. And yes, we will take your application to consider you for deposit insurance, which is you know the good house, housekeeping seal of approval from the FDIC. But at the same time, we want to see a value proposition to the consumer. We want to see the, the number of unbanked and underbanked in the United States coming down. And we want more people as a part of the system because frankly, there is a, a, a symbiotic relationship where the system benefits and the individuals benefit in the long run. Yeah. So both of you are really bullish on um, creating more competition in the market. Yelena, you um, uh, granted a charter to Varro and um, have been doing more with the ILC charter in terms of um, FDIC insurance. And Brian, you've been talking a lot about chartering. Um, tell us a little bit about how you're thinking about this um, and especially how you uh, think you can move forward given the legal uncertainty. Yeah, well, so so look, first of all, um, uh, I would just come back to the point you made a second ago about how confident are we that the current system can suffice to bring everybody into the into the pro process. And I think the answer is, you know, uh, we need to redefine the current system. That That's kind of the insight behind this chartering discussion is, you know, look, the, the, the legacy banks and certainly the larger legacy banks are existing to serve the middle 70% of the country, you know, who, who are perfectly well served by the status quo. And they have a series of highly scaled, highly um, sort of uh, uniform products that most of us use and want. But those products don't necessarily serve the top 1% or the bottom 30%. And that's the whole concept of saying, there's now fintech innovation that is designed to serve those people. So you mentioned Borrow, which is an example of a bank charter applicant. And by the way, the charter hasn't yet been granted, but we're on the cusp of that, I, I, I hope. Thank you um, for the correction. Where, 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 where the whole point of it is to serve a segment of, of the community that isn't currently well served. There are lots of other specialty companies that are realizing, hey, certain communities need a bespoke solution. They, they're not going to work with the off the rack product offered by the biggest banks that serve the majority, right? And so innovation and specialization is key, but that's only going to work if we can bring them into the system, meaning they have to be supervised and be safe and sound. They need to comply with fair lending obligations, those kinds of things. And if we don't do that, these communities are not going to have confidence to, to take advantage. So that's that's my vision versus, you know, the postal banking vision or the Fed accounts vision or whatever, which is, hey, let's, let's make those people go through the grinding years of government to get their financial services versus having a beautiful customer focused experience that gives them what they actually want. You mentioned the legal challenges of granting some of these charters. What I would say is, you know, I, I litigated cases, including bank preemption cases for 25 years of my career. So I feel like I have a pretty good handle on what the legal implications of these things are. And all of us uh, who have done that in our lives know that on any given day, you know, a given district judge might rule against you for whatever reason. Um, well, obviously we take that opinion very seriously. We've carefully scrutinized you know, we think it is a scholarly opinion of one judge among the 93 districts in the United States. Um, but, you know, the district judge in Brown versus Board of Education ruled for the city and against the black plaintiffs, right? And, and nobody thought that was the right decision. And uh, in a great moment of heroism, they took that to the Supreme Court and won. We're going to do that here. I mean, we have 100 years of history of the OCC getting deference in its de in its definition of bank powers, the scope of eligible bank charters, and everything else, and so with all due respect, I I, I don't think one district judge out of ninety three uh, is the last word on the subject. There are a lot of other parts of the country. Um, we have a long history of Supreme Court precedent on our side for this, uh, and that's really what we look to in in defining what our what our chartering powers are. And I'm not going to let those powers get eroded on my watch. Um, so let's continue talking about um, technology. Um, you know, what, while the two of you um, um, have taken a, a similar approach in some ways, you also have very different audiences, right? So Yelena, you, the FDIC largely supervises small community banks, many of whom are challenged, frankly, to keep up with technological change. Um, while you, Brian, you want to be the nation's first fintech controller. Um, and you really make the case that doing so is going to drive financial inclusion. So um, how do you think about this right balance between high tech and high touch to drive broader financial health and well-being? And how do your agencies strive to strike that balance, especially given the differing audiences that you both are serving? 
Um, Yelena, you want to start? Sure. Uh, it has been one of the main things that um, I have frankly focused at the FDIC for the last couple of years. And here's why. Uh, our audience truly is community banks because we're the primary federal supervisor for uh, the community banks in the United States. And while, while, while we have the supervisory authority over all banks in the United States, it's by the, by the virtue of the deposit insurance mandate uh, and the resolution mandate. And so when we go and look at these community banks, quite often they're located in rural communities. And it's in a community where they may have one or two branches. They've been around for a long time. They have uh, banked the, you know, the farmer in town and the farmer's great grandfather. And there is a sense of a community built around those community banks, truly a sense of a community. And so if those banks are no longer able to survive, those communities will suffer because frankly, they will have to move their banking services online or they will have to drive to the next town, which in some parts of America is you know, 50, 60 miles away, in some cases, even longer, even, even further away. And so when we look at the, the very survivability of community banking model in the United States, technology is an absolute must. They have got to adopt new technology and adapt to the changes in the system as, as the larger banks are doing it. And yet they don't have the economies of scale to do so efficiently. It's costly. They have to spend a ton of money on, on BSA, Bank Secrecy Act and anti-money laundering compliance. They still have to do all of the requirements we pretty much ask from the larger banks. We just scale some of them down for the size and the risk profile of the smaller banks. And so what we have done at the FDIC, we have done a couple of initiatives. We created uh, a tech lab, FDI Tech, uh, which is our innovation office, where we are thinking, uh, frankly, how can we do a little bit more to ease the burden on, on community banks and allow them to adapt uh, uh, this new approach and, and frankly, don't not go the way of the blockbuster, right? You want them to to persist and continue for the next hundred years and continue to to service service the, the great the the farmer's great 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 son. Uh, and so we're looking at all of these things and 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 frankly looking on our regulatory side as well to see are there regulations in place that are stifling innovation? Are are we are we kind of applying this archaic system that when you really think about it, uh, our regulations come from in Brian's case overarching regulations, 1865, the Federal Reserve, 1913, you know, FDIC, 1933. And we're looking at, and they have changed over time, but still that framework was set up at a time when, you know, you couldn't imagine of wireless technology. You couldn't imagine that you could, you could communicate, uh, you know, cell phone, what is that, right? And so we're trying to tweak the regulations to, these old regulations to fit the new model and allow innovation so that we actually can have do more with technology and allow community banks to, to frankly survive in the long term. Brian, what do you have to say on this topic? Well, you know, I, I'm actually super optimistic about the impact of technology on community banks. So I'm, I'm going to always take the sort of the positive uh, side of this. I, I think in a number of respects, uh, you know, it, it's true that it's expensive for a community bank to build its own website or, or try to build its own um, you know, cell phone app or something like that. that. That's hard to do. At the same time, if you think about it, community banks historically have been super beholden to a small number of core processors, uh, you know, the FISs of the world, uh, to do a lot of, of things for them, to do their card processing and, uh, and a series of other things. What's great about fintech, of course, is that now community banks have more choices uh, and, and more unbundling abilities to sort of buy data from, from certain uh, uh, kinds of companies or to access uh, credit information without relying on a giant tech. I mean, one of the single hardest things for a community bank to do is to meet ever increasing compliance burdens and risk management burdens, which we impose on them, particularly in the post-crisis era. Enter reg tech, where suddenly you can automate a lot of those processes. So you don't need to hire 50 compliance officers. You can hire five compliance officers and let the computer kind of do the work. Um, that otherwise would have been done by a lot of manual uh, loan review people or, or risk managers. So I think those things, those things are quite good. At the same time, you know, I, I keep emphasizing uh, a lot of these fintechs that are going to want special purpose charters from the OCC are going to be small ent entities themselves. They will look a lot like community banks, but in a more focused area, uh, typically in a more focused vertical, focused on some of these underserved uh, constituents that you're talking about. So I actually will take the positive side of all this. In, in the end, it'll make it easier to run community banks and they can focus on what they're good at, which is relationship management and credit management. Um, and Jen, if I can, if, if I may just add, please. 
from the FDIC's perspective, we have to think outside of the box a little bit, right? Um, and so we are thinking of, about exactly to Brian's point, how to deal with these core processor issues, because banks, small banks in particular, they could use more competition. Again, more competition is good for the consumer. In this case, it's good for the community banks. And so um, I, I want to put a little plug in for something we're doing next week. We're going to uh, announce on Monday, uh, we're going to engage in a, uh, in, in, a, in a very interesting tech event that we're organizing at the FDIC to do a little bit more in this space. And for the announcement, you'll just have to stay tuned until Monday. Okay. Teaser. Uh, um, uh, Cliffhanger, season one. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm thinking tech sprint, but I will. I will wait patiently till Monday. And I'm. I'm thrilled that you're gonna tackle the core processing issue um, because um, you know there's a sector. There, there's a corner of the uh, of the sector where the benefits of technology haven't yet been brought to bear, uh, if you will, um, for smaller for smaller players. I want to go back to something you were talking about just a minute ago, Brian. Um, um, there are so many ways in which technology can be uh, brought to bear on the way uh, banks do their business, both to gain efficiency, um, also to promote greater access, more inclusion. Uh, one of those arenas uh, that I think is getting a lot of scrutiny, not so much from banks, but in general, is the use of AI for um, all kinds of decision-making, underwriting, et cetera. Um, and there is increasing concern about it, particularly um, from a racial equity perspective. Um, you know, so on the one hand, you could say, oh, well, now it's technology, so it's colorblind, right? I'm not seeing the person in front of me. That should make it more fair. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the people, there are real humans who are teaching the AI to do what it does, and we all have uh, biases, whether we recognize them or not. And so. How are you thinking about um, uh, this development? Uh, and what are you both thinking about doing to make sure that as that technology makes its way into the way, into bank decision-making, that it's being done in a way that is ultimately um, bias-free? Well, uh, it, let me, maybe I can start on that, Jen. And um, so I come at this with two kind of premises. So the first premise is, uh, there's not a lot to defend about the status quo. So, so people who say, oh, be very aware of AI because there might be bias in it. I see protest marches in the street about the amount of bias in the status quo. So I, I don't think that it's about having a bias-free world. I think it's about having a less biased world than we have today. So, so people can debate me on that, but I, I would begin with that premise. And then the other premise I have is this, which is, uh, and again, maybe people would take me on on this, but right now the credit underwriting systems we have in this country, the very best of them, only capture about 60% of credit performance, meaning that 40% of the time, they're either approving loans that are going to default or they're denying loans that wouldn't have defaulted. So they're both over-inclusive and under-inclusive. They're, they're highly, highly flawed. So my, the, the second premise is, if you could use AI to achieve a world where every single loan that should get made gets made and every single loan that shouldn't get made gets denied, wouldn't we agree that that, that would be the ideal world sort of regardless of what the you know, underlying the sort of social, social justice implications of that should be like? We don't want to make loans that are going to default. We don't want to put people in a foreclosure if we can avoid it, but we also do not want to deny credit. So when people talk to me about AI and, and the implications of that and credit underwriting, what I think about starts from those premises. What I, am, what I believe would occur when we start unleashing AI on underwriting is something that we need to debate as a society. And that is, I believe that we would significantly increase the number of minority loans that get made compared to the status quo. And I also believe that it's possible we would increase the statistical disparity between minorities and non-minorities. And the reason for that comes back to what I said earlier about the 45 million Americans with no credit score. Those people do not get considered for loans today. So they're not in the statistics and they're heavily minority, okay? Once we bring them in, imagine a world where we could make a million new African-American mortgages that currently don't get made. So a million African-American homeowners are created, but imagine that the approved deny statistical disparity goes up by 30 basis points. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? 
I think reasonable people could actually debate that. And as a society, I think it would be good for us to have that debate because the fetishization of statistics over human beings' life aspirations, to me, is, is probably the wrong balance. I would rather see more people getting credit, even if it means that there's a statistical artifact that makes it look unfair, than to consign those million people to a life of renting because I don't want a statistical disparity. But that's a legitimate policy debate we ought to have as a country. Well, uh, I'm, I'm going to take you up on that. We should uh, offline, let's talk about organizing that because I think you're exactly yep. right. That's a really important discussion to be had. Yelena, what's your take on this? So I'll say that uh, discrimination in lending and banking practices is illegal. And, and that's something that we enforce. And as Brian pointed out, there is a huge potential with respect to artificial intelligence to actually bring into the fold people who are not in the fold right now. And, and there are now, there are, shortcomings to artificial intelligence uh, and, and, and those, you know, maybe version 1.0 is not the version we end up with. Maybe it's 3.0 and we, we, tweak, we tweak the issues as, as we come across them. But I think that uh, discounting what artificial intelligence can do in this space uh, on the premise that uh, either it, it is biased or that uh, it, is, it is not going to provide enough for X, Y, and Z uh, borrower, whatever the characteristics of X, Y, and Z borrower may be, is just going to frankly um, prevent thousands, if not millions, of other people being able to to utilize that uh, the benefit of of the of the artificial intelligence. So I think it's something that regulatory agencies have a lot more work to do in this space, and this is something that I think we're just beginning to tackle. Uh, we're struggling with exactly how to supervise for AI biases, you know, or, or AI technological aspects, quite often, you know, a lot of these companies are on the cutting edge of the technology and our examiners need to need to develop skill sets to catch up in some cases. So we constantly train our examiners as we learn of new developments, we, we try to incorporate them in our training. And then we try to work with banks, frankly, to make sure that the next, that the 2.0 model is a better model, right? Because we want the 3.0 model to be able to expand lending expand financial services and bring more people into the fold. That's ultimately the goal. Okay. I want to shift gears just a little bit now um, and really talk more specifically about financial health and the role that uh, banks um, should have in promoting it. Uh, so when we define financial health, we uh, think of it as when you have a day-to-day -day system that enables people to be resilient and to thrive. So essentially to manage the downside and to take advantage of the upside. Uh, and um, when you tend to think about financial health at the consumer level, I think most people tend to think about the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, given that its mandate is to protect consumers. Um, uh, but obviously uh, there's a uh, uh, a three-legged stool, as we like to say, right? Safety and soundness being one of them, consumer protection being another. And I think both of you would say, and many others would say, I'm um, creating an enabling environment for innovation. Um, so recognizing that you have to balance all of those, um, what do you think the role of banks is in promoting the financial health of their customers? Uh, I'm particularly interested in how you think about that beyond their Community Reinvestment Act mandate. Um, and do you think banks are properly incentivized to design the kind of products and policies and services that actually build the financial health of their customers and their communities um, when often um, it feels like the incentive may be perverse. It may be, you know, they make more money from overdraft as an example um, than causing someone to not overdraft. Um, so talk to me about how you think about the role of banks as it relates to the financial health of their customers. Yeah, Ayala, you wanna you wanna start? Go ahead, Brian. Sure, sure. No, I, I was gonna, I was gonna turn it to my friend. Go ahead, oh, all right. So the, the way um, I look at the financial health of, of consumers is, are you living in fear of being able to pay your bills? And are you living in fear of not being able to feed your family? And is $100 a difference between you putting food on the table or not? And a lot of people are frankly in that fear category. Uh, it, there's data from the Federal Reserve that says 60% of Americans do not have $400. They would have to borrow either from a friend or on a credit card. Uh, if in, in, in a case of emergency. And so as we think about uh, what are the incentives in the system to promote uh, a financial well-being of, of consumers and, and bank customers in particular, you have to think through the lens of a bank. Bank wants 
more customers, right? By the economies of scale work in such a way that more customers you have, broader your base, cheaper the products, the cost of the products that you can offer. And so you, you, you expand your base and you grow. The problem becomes that in order for a bank to acquire new customers, they have two ways of getting them. They have to take them away from another bank or they have to uh, go after the unbanked and underbanked customers who are not banked. And frankly, one proposition going after another bank's customers is more expensive than going after unbanked and underbanked. And, and this is the irony of the game because you, you will, it'll cost you several hundred dollars to take another bank's customers. You have to provide incentives for opening a new account. You have to show the value proposition why you're a be better bank than the previous bank and why you're not going to charge them say overdraft fees like the prior bank. Because the truth of the matter is when that customer gets sixth or seventh overdraft ch uh, charge, they will find a new bank. They will try to find a bank, even if, if, uh, if it's an online only bank or a tech company, FinTech, that's going to provide services without charging them that, that overdraft fee. And I think banks are getting to this point where they understand that getting new customers is so important and maintaining good relationships with the existing customers. And this is where social media played tremendous influence that they are working I would frankly say they were working hard in figuring out how to retain the customers and how to reach out to the new customer and offer the value proposition. And so what we have done uh, together with the OCC and, and the Fed is take a look at this and say, what, do consumer, what does that consumer who doesn't have 400 bucks need? Well, they need 400 bucks and they need it from some source. Do we want banks in this space? Yes, we do. Why? Because more competition is good, drives the cost of the product down, and we can supervise for both safety and soundness and consumer compliance which is not something that necessarily gets done for non-bank uh, providers in the, in the uh, small dollar lending space. And so we put, we put together you know, our staffs and, and, and our heads together and we said, can we issue guidance, joint guidance on small dollar uh, products and, and services? And so we did, we did that about a month ago and it could not have been more timely, frankly, because I think it's going to be crucial that banks are in this space offering small dollar products and frankly, building value for, for their customer. Because that customer that comes in maybe just for that small dollar loan, will six months later, a year later, open up a checking account. And maybe a little, little while later, they will open up a savings account. And maybe they can only put $20 a month in that savings account. But that's going to be something that later on, they will be, bring their kids to open up an account. And so there's this benefit, it's an ecosystem. And the beginning of that ecosystem is treat your customer well and you as a banker, as a bank, need to be highly invested in your customer's well-being because frankly, if you're not, you will lose the customer and the system will be worse off for it. Brian? Well, let me, uh, let, let me take it in a slightly different direction. So, so I think that um, uh, I, I come at this from the proposition, uh, maybe there are two, that growth is a great thing, and too many people have not been, you know, allowed to participate in growth economies. So, you know, in the last 20 years, if there's one lesson, it's that equity holders got much, much, much richer, and people who worked for a, you know, wage earning job, particularly an hourly rate wage earning job, stayed flat, and and so those people are even fell behind. So, I, I think you know, what financial health means is that you're able to move forward in the case of a lifetime, that you may start as I did making 201 an hour plus tips. And then one day you may make a lot of money in some other some other profession because there are ladders, and banks at every stage should help you get to the next rung on the ladder. Um, I think the problem we have today uh, is for a variety of reasons, the incentives of banks and the incentives of consumers are not aligned as well as they need to be. Post financial crisis environment, we don't want there to be any risk in the system. And so here's the problem is when you lend or provide other financial services to people who are lower on the credit spectrum, they're higher risk. And if we've decided we don't want any loans to default, the only way to make sure no loans default is to not lend to anybody who isn't rich. Right? Again, I'm talking as a kid who grew up in Pueblo, Colorado and waited tables for 201 an hour plus tips. I, I want and need credit to be extended to me, even though I might have a little bit of default risk. So how do you solve this? Well, this is where I think there are innovators out there, many of whose stories have not been fully told yet. I'm going to tell you one story right now, but they're innovators who are trying to solve this. So here's a great story. When I was in my private sector life, just, just six or nine months ago, um, and I was living here in San Francisco, I was advising a company 
uh, who was looking at ways of having a more inclusive mortgage product. And I came up with the idea of what I called the foreclosure proof mortgage. Here was the concept behind it, right? And this is like a, an example of how do we align interest. The idea is um, loans typically are a fixed price uh, thing, right? You borrow $100,000 and you have to repay $100,000 no matter what happens. If the home value declines below $100,000, you still have to pay $100,000. And so when you're underwater on your mortgage, you tend to default. That's one, one thing we learned in the financial crisis is the riskiest product was, was the, uh, you know, the zero down payment pay option arm where people had no equity. The concept of the foreclosure proof mortgage was, what if you had a loan where if the appraised value of the home fell below the loan balance for a certain period of time, the payoff amount would reset to whatever the home value was. So you'd constantly preserve equity in the house. What studies show is the bank wouldn't lose money there because people aren't gonna move out of the house. They, they, they just wanna know that their balance out there is such that if they sold the house, they would still have equity to extract. What that would do is it would preserve the monthly payments and reduce the likelihood of default. It would keep people feeling, st feeling stable and secure in their house. And it would also promote labor mobility because they could actually move without losing money. What a great idea. I mean, that's a way of aligning incentives through innovation. So I, I believe the problem has been that for a variety of reasons, both risk intolerance and just a failure of imagination, um, we, we have allowed consumer interests and bank interests to diverge. I think one of our roles as regulators is to bring those interests back into line. I, as I said at the beginning, we have a lot to talk about, and I knew we would run out of time for it. Um, we're going to have to leave it there. I think that was a good note to end on. I really appreciate um, Yelena and Brian being with us. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you the pleasure was mine. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>